Hey guys, happy Thursday night. So here's what we have going on tonight. I decided the past few days as I just kind of stepped back and was giving some thought to things and just doing, I like to read a lot, always checking things because I learned that after leaving this group. You don't want to be just stuck in a mode and stuck in a bubble and stuck in a tunnel. I want to breathe the fresh air. I want to let my brain think and observe and and verify. And so I was watching some things. Now this first one, so here's what we're going to do. I always never finish a sentence, do I? Uh, I'm working on it. I said that before too. <laughs> okay, so every now and then, probably every few days, I would like to share. I have a real quite a body of information now uh, via clips and testimonies of other people. I think it's important to see the similarities. And I'm asking you to consider, to open up your mind, to think for yourself. Because no one leaves being coerced or having some sort of uh, intervention. Um, is that the word I want? Intervention? You know what I'm saying. It happens when it's like something building up, building up, building up, and then boom, that last thing gets put up there. It's like, wait a minute here. Wait a cotton picking minute. So I want you to have your cotton picking minute moment for sure sooner rather than later. So I hope you'll be honest with yourself and listen to these clips. I chose each of these because I felt each one added a little bit of texture to the whole fabric of what exactly is a cult because it's many things. It's not it's not an elevator pitch. It's not something you can just say. It's it's um it's multi-layered. And that's why so many find themselves in one. I don't think there's any need to intersperse anything between these. I think you can make the comparisons. If you hear about communal living, you know that that's, that's what the servicemen's homes are all about. They have men, women, the husbands, wives living with strange men who don't know them and they don't know them vice versa. Um, some have a child in the home, like up in Watertown, New York. That's a commune. That's communal living. And it's not safe. And it's not good. And it's not healthy for that little girl. And it bothers me every single day. And I don't care if the kid lives in the home or not. Like in Woodbrook, there's a young girl. She may not live in the home with the GIs, but her whole entire life is around that communal stuff and that extreme busyness there is no normal life for those children and so take these apply them I believe you know it, everything everyone says is not going to apply across the board but take it in the spirit in the context of what is being shared I believe if you search you'll find you will find truth if you search honestly Right now, this first one, this gentleman, someone shared this with me, and I thought the first part of their video was excellent because he sounds like he was in NTCC for sure, but obviously it was just another similar group. And then the other ones, um, each one added some value if you will listen, and I really hope that you do, and I really hope that you consider because it's what it took for all of us. I don't know really of anyone who left this group and said, oh, I'm getting out of this cult. You don't even know what has happened. You have to get out after that last thing happens that you realize and your eyes are opened. And once you get on the outside, and as you hear these people talk about the shunning right away, it's not those of us who didn't want to have anything to do with anyone <laughs> But we knew what was going to happen, didn't we? We knew we would lose friends. 
over this. Some people, family. Some people, their own children, they would shun. Because Davis set that up. And he's not the only one. This is a spirit of cult. This is a spirit of authoritarianism and of narcissism. And so please, please listen with an anxious heart to know the truth. Thank you. Hello, welcome to the channel. Here I'll be discussing some of the issues that arise from spending a lifetime in an evangelical Christian cult and the long-term effects that has on a person, short-term effects, how I got out of it, myriad of issues, and hopefully if you have been in a similar situation or if you're currently in the situation that I was in for over 30 years, you'll get some help from this. You'll get a chance to get some answers uh, hopefully it will encourage you to think and to critically evaluate where you're at and where you're going. It is my intent to try and help people escape the damaging long-term effects of extreme Christian beliefs and some of the repercussions and how it affects your life. It's uh, something that we're going to delve into in future series, maybe. For today, I just want to talk about where I came from and how I got out. Briefly encapsulate that. So, I was born and raised into a Pentecostal church here in McMinnville, Oregon. It was always taught as being the one true church. They, everyone else is going to hell. Everyone else is lost except for us. And spent 12 years in their private Christian school. It was extremely uh, rigid in the way, they're, the way they think, the way they operate. There is no outside influence allowed whatsoever very much an isolationist community, which is a huge red flag for, you know, being considered a cult is when, say, for example, you have two Catholic churches and they don't talk to each other. Well, they're both Catholics. Why shouldn't they communicate with each other and have fellowship? And <laughs> if you have two Presbyterian churches and they don't have any communication with each other, that should set off a red flag that there's an isolationist movement that's there for a reason. And so this was the case with my church, is that there were many churches around the area. We had nothing to do with them. There were entire churches that I had no idea they even existed until after I had left that group and had gone and done my own research and found out, hey, these people exist. And that tells you two things. One, they're not interested in sharing ideas with another group, even if that group is very, very similar to their own. And more to the point, they don't want people in their or this local group to get infected with uh, how things are operated in other churches. It's they call it ministerial ethics. Really, it's more about protecting their ideas, protecting their own concepts. And a huge red flag is when they cut off outside communication completely. They say no internet, no social media. They severely restrict use of the internet and Facebook. And they don't want the church members in constant contact with family members, with friends, except for the express purpose of trying to proselytize them into that organization. And so this is just setting off alarm bells to normal people saying, hey, this is not the way you run a typical church. This is not how you run any social group. This is extraordinary. So 
<clears throat> cutting off communication in general, specifically cutting off communication with other groups that believe the exact same thing you do, and another huge red flag is they decide who you can and can't socialize with within that same congregation. So, for example, uh, someone is maybe not following all the rules quite right. They can be disfellowshipped. You, you don't let people talk to them and be around them for a certain amount of time. Or a guy wants to date a particular girl, he has to ask permission from church leadership to ask that girl out on a date. Certainly to get engaged or to get married. And so there's all this this concept that the pastor, the leadership, they know God's will for your life, and therefore, if you step outside of that set of bounds and rules, that somehow you're stepping outside of the divine will of God, which is just absolute nonsense. <laughs> there's been a number of marriages that failed that had the approval of those men of God, and... It just never seemed like that seemed to make one bit of difference. It was just, but besides the fact that you have no freedom to socialize, really, who you want to socialize with. So in a very inclusive uh, environment across the board, whether that's internal, external, uh, from a theological perspective or just a social perspective, you are in a bubble. You're locked into this box. And I did not realize how damaging that is to a person's um, personality and their mind until after I got out of that. And it was such a huge world-changing experience to just spend time in public and think everyone here, these are all, all people I can get to know and be friends with, and... Everything is is just wide open. It's it's it blows your mind the first time you experience that. And to some, that's like you know, you might say that's absurd or ridiculous. But when you've spent thirty years in this environment, in the bubble of the cult, it's it's something to get out of it. So one more red flag is when a group is enforcing tithes, offerings, various forms of giving, they require you to pay a fixed percentage of your income in a given um, paycheck or however you get your money. So let's say 10% before taxes absolutely has to be handed in weekly basis, bi-weekly basis, so, there's many people that simply can't afford that, especially in the impoverished middle class that's been happening of late. People simply would be losing their apartments or their houses because they couldn't pay rent, they couldn't pay their mortgages. A married couple with a one or two year old kid, and they have to move back in with mom and dad. It's like in that situation, a real church should say, okay, you don't have to hand over 10% of your income pre-tax until you can get back on your feet and support yourself and keep a roof over your family's heads. And yet there's no excuse for it. Like they, they push and they push, hand over the money, hand over the money. And when it gets to the point where a person leaves that group and the leadership that has been there for decades has watched every second of that person's life just immediately cuts them off. If you knew somebody for, for 30, 35 years and you knew you saw them three, four times a week for the entirety of that 30, 40 years and then you can instantly stop communicating with that person. You instantaneously don't text them, email them, call them, visit them. That immediately tells you this is a person that does not care about you personally. They don't care about saving your soul 
or whatever that means. They are expressly interested only in influencing your life and taking your money and whatever power that gives them. But they certainly don't love you. And that's what I saw out of 150, 160 people. Maybe three or four still talk to me. Text, email, or occasionally meet for lunch. But to be that cold-hearted, to cut people off so completely and thoroughly shows it's a it's a very twisted it's a corrupt and it's in some ways an immoral organization there's no other way to put it decent basic human empathy should show you hey just love people accept people for who they are you know i don't exclude people if they want to stay in that group i don't exclude people if people do dumb things, you still care about them as an individual for who they are. And this is something that should be blatantly obvious to, and yet that can go on and multiple people leave. You just cut them off, disfellowship them, cut them out of the social circle. Um, it's sad. And it's, as I said, it's, it's controlling it's very much a cold. How I escaped, how I discovered I needed to get out, what it came down to was being intellectually honest with myself, being willing to be curious and not questioning where the evidence led, just being willing to look at it objectively and not stop. That meant verifying what I was told my entire life. There is a Buddhist teaching that says to cultivate compassion, we should look at all beings as if they were our mother, as if they were once somebody who cared for and nurtured us. And when I first heard that, it was so impactful. But then I thought, well, wait, are we talking about my mother? My mother forced me to wear a pink cast when I broke my wrist, even though I was a tomboy and I wanted a blue one. And when she took me to work with her, she told me to go outside and chase lizards, even though outside happened to be a lumber yard with acres of towering wood stacks and machinery and strange men. She used to lay hands on me and try to cast out demons because she thought my strong-willed nature was of the devil. Affection wasn't natural for either of us. And in those moments we tried, it just felt obligatory and uncomfortable. And so our efforts weren't often. I never doubted my mother's love though. She just showed it in her own way. Like when she bought me a tetherball pole. Even though I was an only child, I don't think she understood the game or me. She came to all of my soccer matches and no matter what was happening, I could hear her on the sidelines yelling, be there. And for some reason, without question, she let me name her black cat after the disciple, Simon Peter. <laughs> you could say we had an unorthodox mother-daughter relationship, but it worked for us because all we had was each other. My dad left before I was two years old, leaving my mom heartbroken, alone, and divorced by the time she was 22. She showed her pain the same way she showed her love, which is to say it wasn't evident. I knew she was aching because I was witness to her search for acceptance. First, we tried a megachurch, hoping to find community and answers. But it was easy to go unseen there in the thousands of people and then we tried a Christian singles group. And I remember loving it as a kid because we went on camping trips. But for some reason, that didn't work out either. And then one day, we found ourselves in someone's living room. And in many ways, my mom is still there, sitting on that living room couch, stuck. I don't know who invited us, but I wish that I did. I wish that I did so I could scream at them. At first, it seemed like an ordinary house church, 
It was a group of Christians gathering together once a week to worship and to pray and to sing. Harmless, right? Until it wasn't. It didn't seem like a cult. We lived in regular houses, right next to your house. We went to public school with your kids. We sat impatiently right next to you at that same red light. Only we didn't follow an imam or a rabbi or even a priest. We followed an apostle who said he was getting direct revelation from God. And God was telling him to tell us that we were set apart from you, or we were chosen. God was telling him to tell us to turn our backs on the sick, on the poor, on the gay, or anybody who argued with our beliefs because it was too late for them. They had lost God's favor. To my mom, whose life had been shattered by my dad, who had been thrown into single parenthood, the apostle's living room wasn't such a bad place to be. He promised her guidance so she wouldn't have to do this alone and offered her belonging without judgment. He seemed to see her when she felt so unnoticed by everybody else. I remember when I was a kid once someone asked me what my superpower would be. And of course I said to be invisible. But my answer would be different now because I saw what invisibility did to my mom. It didn't matter how much I stared up at her. My blue eyes mirrored my father's blue eyes, which were reminders of rejection, of being erased. We've all felt this longing for connection, to be noticed by somebody that we admire, to be cared for them is elevating. It can become the only thing that matters, especially when reeling from abandonment. I've interviewed dozens of theologians about what a cult is, and I've received dozens of definitions. My research has led me to define it this way. Cults are controlling. The leader claims to get a special God-given knowledge. There's groupthink, indoctrination, cognitive dissonance, and oftentimes, isolation. Someone who is raw, like my mom was when the apostle found her, is perfect bait. Growing up, my mom was in survival mode, and so I never thought to ask her what her dreams were. She never thought to ask mine either. But I think her dreams were to be married, have more kids, have a job she enjoyed, and be surrounded by friends. Her journey, though, stopped when she walked into that living room. There she found kinship. She became friends with the apostle and his wife, and we were assigned a pastor to watch over our family. I suppose that was the first strange turn our group took. Family, pastor, apostle. Today my mom is in the, pastor, or the apostle's inner circle, which is a very esteemed place to be. They drink expensive wine together in cognac. And they go on retreats to wine country and on Alaskan cruises. The apostle says he's called to the rich. And so my mom pretends to be. It wasn't always like this, though. The oddities evolved over time. In elementary school, I told my friends to rid their homes of Native American art because such symbols were evil. In middle school, I told my friends to stop going to their Christian churches because any organized religion was misled. In high school, I told my friends that any bad thing that was happening to them, whether it was their bad grade in math class or their parents' divorce or their boyfriends breaking up with them, that was God's way of speaking to them, punishing them. My mom was remarried by now to someone she had met in the group and we had outgrown the Apostles' living room. We had expanded to homes throughout the city, throughout the state even. And we were gathering once a month in a large auditorium to hear the Apostle speak. And his teachings were then distributed through PDFs and cassette mm -hmm. tapes. And I hated it, because I too wanted to be seen. 
I too had been abandoned when my father walked away. But the apostles' living room offered me no healing. And so I escaped, but not in an exciting, fleeing in the middle of the night kind of way. More of a slow, painful, peeling the band-aid off kind of way. It started by going to college. I was the first to do so in my family. And I was only allowed to go with the agreement that I would meet weekly over the phone with our pastor. And so I did so reluctantly. But it allowed me to study religion and journalism. And when I finally got that job, that first newspaper job, I took a stand and I refused to hand over my paycheck to my stepdad. That was supposed to be a requirement because I wasn't married. And then I continued to inch away further by becoming a religion reporter. You can imagine my career choice was not looked upon with favor. Journalism was grievous, but religion reporting, that was spiritually dangerous. Going into mosques and temples, they said, open myself up to demons, but I thought it opened myself up to compassion and understanding. Today, I run my own religion news publication. It's called Spokane Faves, stands for Spokane Faith and Values. Myself and a handful of reporters cover religion news in the inland Northwest. And I have 40 columnists who write for me, atheists, Buddhists, Quakers, Hindus. They're all writing from their faith perspective. But you can imagine the tension continued to build between my mom and I as I forged my own path and as I began to speak out against the cult. My hope was that we could agree to disagree. But to her, or at least to the men who oversee her, that was impossible. One day, she sent me two UPS boxes filled with my childhood things, my soccer trophies, my baseball cards, even my own baby photos. And with it was a letter that said, because I continued to disobey God's law, we can no longer be in relationship. I'm confident she did not write that letter. She only signed it. The story of my mom and I begins with her wanting to be seen. Eventually she was, but she lost her own sight and her voice in the process. She wanted community, but she sacrificed her family. Too many vulnerable people find a safe and comfortable couch, one they can sink into and forget their wounds, but they don't have to stay there. I wish that I could sit next to my mom and we could be awkward together again, but I can't be part of a faith community that tells people to leave their children behind, and she can't be part of a mother-daughter relationship that tells people to leave the apostle behind. I waited 19 years before I finally met my dad. I have interviewed cult survivors. People find their way out every single day. Lives can be repaired and relationships can be restored. If I hold on to hope hard enough, I believe that one day, just like I met my dad, I can meet my mom again. If I hold on to that hope, I think that hope is powerful enough to pull people off of the couch and through the front doors of the cult next door. And I believe that if I hold on to that hope hard enough, she'll be there one day to hit that tetherball back to me. Thank you. We love cults, don't we? The word cult, it just rolls off the tongue. It just sounds evil. Though it wasn't always that way. In the first century, Christianity was called a cult and then went on to become one of the world's main religions. But still, the sinister sound of the word just kind of sealed its fate. Yes, cults are endlessly fascinating and always something that someone else is in. I don't think anyone leaves the house in the morning and says, goodbye, honey, I'm off to join a cult today. So how is it then that cults seem to be everywhere? Someone is in them. The fact of the matter is, I can tell you firsthand that that no one who is in a cult ever thinks they're in a cult. 
And while some belief systems are more extreme than others, it is a continuum. We are all subject to indoctrination of some form, whether we realize it or not. We are all born into a family that teaches us certain values and ideals. And as we grow, we're embedded with ideas about right and wrong, or about how life should look, or how the world should be. Also, human beings, we are wired to go along with the group. We're tribalistic, and this is something that um, makes us tend to other people who are different. We like to be around people who are similar to us. We tend to cancel people whose opinions we don't like. This is most obvious in the religious realm, but it's also the case in the political realm, uh, on the internet, in social groups, really anywhere where people align around a common belief. Now, some might say that I was in a cult. I was raised a Jehovah's Witness. But if you had asked me back then whether I was brainwashed when I believed that all of you were going to die at Armageddon any day now, and I would be saved by God, I would have said, no way. Or if you had thought that it was crazy that I would have refused a blood transfusion rather than save my life if it came to that, I would have said that you just don't understand. No, I didn't think that I was in a cult. I just thought that I had the true religion. In fact, I was so sure that I had the truth that I moved to mainland China to be a missionary. I wanted to teach other people this truth. I spent years learning Mandarin so that I could bring this message to China, where they hadn't heard the truth before. My intentions were good, I thought. I mean, I wanted to save them from dying at Armageddon, like all of you. <laughs> Ironically, it was in China that I ended up finding a bit of freedom for the first time. And I realized that this probably should have been the first sign that something was up, because most people, when they get to China, do not feel more free. <laughs> but it was different for me, because back home in my community, my life revolved around my religion. Uh, it was a very insular community, and we all believed the same things. We were busy with our preaching work and our meetings. In China, all of this was different, because my religion was illegal in China. And that meant it couldn't operate in the same way. So what this effectively meant was that, for the first time in my life, I had some physical space from my community. But the byproduct was I also had some mental space from this constant indoctrination and the teachings that told me what I believed. Also, I was speaking Mandarin, this language, which, if anyone here has ever learned Mandarin, I'm not sure, but for an English speaker, it's almost, it almost is like you have to excavate your mind in order to speak it. As I sat there across from my Chinese Bible students, teaching them these things that I had held as lifelong truths, it started to sound like I was, it was as if I was hearing them for the first time in this new language. And to be honest, some of them sounded kind of crazy. Venturing outside my community caused me to see things in different ways, in a new light. Things I had believed my whole life were true suddenly didn't add up. Uh, truths that I had held dear slowly started to even feel wrong. I had a crisis of faith, and my life turned upside down. It wasn't easy to leave the Jehovah's Witnesses. We were taught that leaving was a worse sin than even murder or child abuse. It was the one sin God would not forgive. Also, it wasn't easy to change my life. I had only ever been a Jehovah's Witness. I hadn't done anything else. My husband was a Jehovah's Witness elder. I had only ever preached. I didn't go to college. I didn't have any kind of career to fall back on. You don't do these things when you think the world is ending. And if that wasn't bad enough, when my friends in my religion got wind of the fact that I was having these doubts, I was immediately shunned from the community. I was considered dangerous for having these beliefs. Now, what this effectively means for a person who has been trained to build their life around a community is that suddenly everything is gone. Even family members that just disappeared, friends I had had my whole life, vanished. 
Now, you might wonder, what kind of person would cut off their best friend overnight over a difference of belief? Or their own daughter, or their sister, or granddaughter? If you're wondering what kind of person, I can tell you. Someone like me. Someone maybe like you. Most of us never get the chance I had to fully grasp how much it is the way that we're raised and the community that we live in affects the way we see everything. And that's because our own culture, or to say it another way, cult, reaches to the ends of our day-to-day -day experience. My story is the rare tale of someone who had to question the very foundation of their life, and therefore question everything. But it's also the bigger, more universal story of how human beings develop belief within a community, and how sometimes those beliefs that we take for granted as truths can blind us to bigger, larger truths. I was looking for something fun. My brain is always going a million miles. In the 1960s, a physicist named Thomas Kuhn was studying the history of science, and he was looking at the trajectory of our understanding of the physical world. He noticed something strange, and that was that Newton's theories of mechanics did not seem to mesh with Aristotle's that had come before. In fact, by comparison, Aristotle's seemed wrong, though they had been a breakthrough at the time. They weren't wrong in and of themselves, but what Kuhn came to see was that Newton had opened up an entirely new way of seeing the world. New patterns emerged that had not been previously available to us. We couldn't see them. Up until this time, most people had thought of science as a continuous march towards finding ultimate truth. That everything that we discovered built on what came before. What Kuhn saw was that, in fact, this wasn't always the case. That quite often, the path to finding deeper scientific truth wasn't so orderly. In fact, it required changing how we saw what we thought we knew. And that could sometimes be a very messy process. So messy that scientific communities sometimes looked like my old religious community when it came to evolving their thinking. But this is science. Surely the most rational among us are not prone to this, right? And surely she's not equating religion and science, is she? No, I'm not. But we are all prone to this. Kuhn observed that two scientists could see the same event occur, and because they were proponents of radically different theories, conclude entirely different things. They tended to discover what they expected to discover. It was the same for me and my religion. I saw evidence it was true everywhere I looked. This is because our interpretation of the world determines what we see. But that wasn't the only thing. There's another parallel. Kuhn saw something in science that I saw in my religion, too, and that was that an accepted theory could answer all of the questions asked of it. It could add up. It could seem to have integrity and still be fundamentally flawed, wrong. And therefore, the answers it gave were wrong, too. My old religion answered all of my disturbing questions of life. Really, any question you have that disturbs you, I think this religion could answer. Why are we here? Why do we die? What is the purpose of life? Everything. But as I had come to learn, the premise was flawed, and therefore, so were those answers. They were meaningless. The first time that I came across Kuhn and read about these steps that took place on the road to scientific discovery, I was stunned. Because point by point, step by step, they mirrored what had happened in my community and with me when I had changed my thinking, when I had had this personal revolution of sorts. You see, this is not just the story of scientists or religious people. This is the story of human beings. We are wired to go along with the group. When we believe something, it is really difficult for us to see what things we're not seeing. In the 17th century, 
Galileo was tried and died under house arrest for supporting the theory that the earth revolved around the sun. A little while later, in the 1800s, a Hungarian doctor raised the idea that if physicians washed their hands in the hospital between seeing patients, fewer people would die. He ended up disgraced and in a mental institution. These people were right. <laughs> Nearly everyone around them was wrong. What, under, what understandings do we hold now that could be wrong? Before a scientific breakthrough occurs, there's always a crisis in the field. Experiments give results that don't add up with existing theories, or internal contradictions are found in those theories. There's upheaval in the community. There's pushback. Proponents of new theories are often ridiculed and ostracized. My exit from my religion and the aftermath was not easy. It was really hard to be the one to speak up. It was embarrassing to realize that I had been wrong my whole life. Questioning truths is not easy for any of us. And it is also not easy for those around us who share those same beliefs. I remember one time after I left my religion, I went to a cafe and I ran into my now ex-husband, the elder. And he didn't talk to me because he's not allowed to talk to me. I'm an apostate. But he did text me. <laughs> <laughs> and what he said was, your eyes looked like the eyes of a dead person. It wasn't easy to be seen this way by the people I had loved or I had shared my life with. But it didn't bother me as much as you might think. And not only because he was my ex-husband, <laughs> but also because I no longer saw the world as I once had. Kuhn said that whenever a scientific breakthrough occurred and an old way of seeing was replaced by a new way of seeing, the world itself seemed to change. We learned that the planets did revolve around the sun. The world changed. When I held the beliefs of my old religion, I saw the terrible world that I had been taught to see. It was full of terrible people who would hurt you and didn't care, worldly people. I saw earthquakes and food shortages, all signs of the apocalypse. I saw a God who cared only about a few of us and was going to kill all the rest. When my thinking changed, the world changed. This world I encountered now was full of really good and kind and loving people. I saw disasters, yes, earthquakes, but I also saw people who were going to help others during these disasters, risking their own lives. I saw a world that had problems, but had people using their lives to try to solve these problems. This new world that I discovered was, it had pain and suffering, but it was also so full of love and goodness and beauty. So, can we trust all of our beliefs about the world? Our truths feel comfortable. Could that be making some of them feel more true than they actually are? If each of us stepped outside of our community, our peer group, our age group, our political party, our country, what new beliefs might we hold? What ways of seeing could we change that could, in turn, change the world? Thank you. In the late 60s, early 70s, there was a movement that took place primarily in California called the Jesus Movement, where ex-hippies grew up a little bit, had some kids, and decided to channel all of that anti-establishment angst into religion. My father was one such ex-hippie, and together with my grandfather, he started a small cult called The Assembly. Yeah, this is a super light-hearted story. <laughs> so I find myself, at five years old, I'm standing on a street corner in my favorite conservative dress, the pink one with the white pinstripes. And I have my favorite white purse slung over my shoulder because I love purses. 
almost more than I love Christ himself. (laughs) And my dad is yelling the gospel at people as they walk by because he believes that's a surefire way to win people to Christ. I'm terrified because I'm a quiet kid, and I'm shy, and I avoid confrontation at all costs. And even in my brief five years of living, I have learned that yelling the gospel can be interpreted by some as confrontational. (laughs) But I've been taught that I could be the only thing standing between a soul and the burning, fiery furnaces of hell. So, there I am. It's at that moment that I see her. She's an older woman, and she's got this gray flyaway hair, and she's not wearing any nail polish, and I don't understand how anybody outside of the group I'm in would go one day without nail polish because I love nail polish almost as much as I love Christ himself. (laughs) But it's totally forbidden. She locks eyes with me, and she walks up to me, and she gets down on one knee, and she says, one day you will grow up, and you will realize you can leave all of this. All of us have had to grow up and leave something. Probably not a cult. It might have been an unhealthy relationship or a drug habit. Maybe you just have a really strong sweet tooth. Leaving is incredibly difficult, but it is also completely life-changing. A fun fact that all cults share is that they reject the label cult. Even now, 16 years since I left, my parents will give me a list of reasons why the assembly was not a cult. So fine. It wasn't a cult. It was an evangelical, fundamentalist, non-denominational, religious fringe group (laughs) whose charismatic leader could do whatever he wanted. But it wasn't a cult. Sure, we had some strange religious beliefs. You might even call them extreme. And we did live in communal homes together. Maybe we didn't exactly integrate into society with silly things like demanding careers. But it wasn't a cult, because we had mainstream religious beliefs, like God is all-present, God is all-knowing, and women can't pierce their ears. (laughs) We wanted to return to the simple life of the early Christians. Not sure we knew exactly how early we were talking. We didn't want to be literally thrown to the lions. But also, do women really need equality? So I guess post-Augustine, but pre-feminist, early Christians. (laughs) My grandparents, George and Betty, were in charge. George was a fantastic public speaker, a charismatic leader, and an abusive, narcissistic, pathological liar. My father was an elder, and my mother was his wife. But it wasn't a cult because women could go to the beach just like anybody, as long as we were fully clothed. Because nothing derails the will of an almighty God like a woman in a (laughs) one-piece. The assembly targeted college-aged kids, vulnerable because they're on their own for the first time. And they're looking for a community, a place where they can connect with other people. Every summer, my dad would pack up my mom, my sister and I, and we would drive to another state to build the assembly throughout the U.S. These trips are some of my favorite childhood memories. We had good times together, and we thought we were doing the work of the Lord. But as I grew up, 
I started to realize the work of the Lord has a lot of rules. If you're wondering what this life looks like, here is a list of things that were forbidden: dating, television, science, ambitious females. Those things are so dangerous. How to get the most of Grammarly free? It's Kayla on behalf of Grammarly to tell you all about. Clapping loudly after a performance, God only gets the glory with a soft clap. Also forbidden: psychiatry, dancing, happiness, freedom, adorable baby puppies. <laughs> But don't worry, there was still so much in the assembly that we could enjoy, like kale, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> creepy men. Climate change denial, pyramid schemes were a big thing. Weird diets, also enjoyable anxiety, sorrow, depression, <laughs> untreated. Okay, because psychiatry is for unbelievers. Cults don't want to be defined as a cult because it empowers its members to take a critical look at it. Language in cults is controlled because language is powerful. This happens in the real world too. Despite what 98% of our world's scientists say, let's not call it climate change. When I was five years old, my mom was trying to recruit this hairdresser into our group, so she sent me for a haircut. I told her that my secret hero was Mary Lou Retton, the Olympic gymnast. And she tried to cut my hair like hers. Basically, I came out of there looking like Javier Bardem in No Country for Old Men. <laughs> Maybe a little less murdery. I was ecstatic. My parents were appalled. Short hair was God's plan for men only. At five years old, I had already foiled the Almighty God and His somewhat specific and kind of fragile plan. For my hair, <laughs> the assembly had a school for all the kids to go to through eighth grade. My mom was the principal for about two seconds until the elders realized they had mistakenly put a woman in charge. <laughs> Women were never encouraged to be in the workplace, but if they had to be, they should not be in charge of men. That wasn't biblical. But remember, it wasn't a cult. It was a wonderful place to be a young woman. We didn't have the burden of forming our own opinions. The men got to do that heavy lifting. It's so luxurious to be told what to think, especially by wonderfully power-hungry men like Elder Earl. Sure, he didn't see the wisdom in a good stick of deodorant. <laughs> But when I was 15, and I had the gall to wear lipstick to a church meeting, he had the wisdom to tell me I had distracted him the entire two-hour meeting because my lips were on my face. <laughs> Revlon's light lip blush number 666 <laughs> had kept this poor servant of God from hearing God's voice. That was my bad. I needed to apologize. Because the assembly did target colleges, I was allowed to go to college, and this was the biggest break of my life. I had to start a Bible study on campus at UC Irvine, and I had to live in a training home in Fullerton. Training homes were the assembly's communal living homes, where groups of people would live with an elder, his wife, and kids. Basically, it was a super fun way of making sure that we had no free time. Cults are all-consuming; they don't allow their members to invest in a life outside of the group. But college became a refuge for me. It was the first time in my life I could spend hours of my day without seeing anybody from the assembly. And at the same time, 
I was getting an education. This world that I had been taught was dark, was actually amazing. Get this, women in the arts, women in science. <laughs> there was a place for me there if I wanted it. I started to see how small my worldview really was. I could have left the assembly by then, I was over 18. But in a cult, when you leave, you're shunned. And I wasn't ready to lose my family and my friends. Women, children, and people of color were second-class citizens in the assembly, to put it mildly. There was emotional and psychological abuse, but there was also physical abuse. When I was a young girl, I saw my uncle abusing my cousins, and I told my dad what I had seen. He told me he would take care of it, and the assembly did, by covering it up. Shortly after I graduated from college, I found out that my uncle's abuse had just continued the entire time. My grandparents had systematically covered it up, and my own parents and the leadership in the assembly had maintained a code of silence, trusting the Lord when nothing of substance had changed. Cults view professional help from anybody outside of their group as a threat to their way of life. Women were never to leave their husbands, and we did not believe divorce was biblical. So my aunt and cousins had no safe place to go in the assembly. It was time for me to leave. I could not be in a group that sacrificed women and children so that a few men could stay in charge. Staunch loyalty to any group is wrong if it means supporting an abusive, narcissistic, pathological liar. Because that abuse and that pathology, it doesn't stay up with the leader. It trickles down in the group, and good people end up doing really bad things. My sister and I left the assembly together. We confronted our grandparents with what we had found out, and George kicked us out of the house. I have never seen my grandparents since the day I left the assembly, and my relationship with my parents is complicated. It takes a lot of work to unlearn behaviors after you leave something like that. There was a lot of questioning the paradigm I'd been raised to believe, and it was hard. <laughs> But I can tell you that even the hardest day of freedom was better than the best day in a cult. So what does a young woman do once she's left the cult she was raised in? Besides a lot of therapy. <laughs> I went crazy, you guys. <laughs> crazy. I watched every rated R movie <laughs> that had ever been produced since the dawn of time. Okay, I, I don't regret a minute of it. <laughs> I cut my hair short, painted my nails Satan red, <laughs> pierced my ears. More importantly, I admitted I want to have a career. I'm going to be one of those scary independent women. I started writing comedy because comedy for me is the absolute best way to take ownership of my past. Laughing is powerful. A few years after I had left the assembly, the romance of short hair and nail polish had kind of worn off. I was walking down the street in L.A. when I saw her, a young girl in a conservative dress, She was standing on the street corner next to a man who was yelling the gospel at people as they walked by. I walked up to her, and I knelt down in front of her, and I looked her in the eye, and I said, one day you will grow up and you will realize you can leave all of this. 
Thank you. I have always been drawn to community. Being in community, building communities that I believe in. I've been a lifelong learner, seeker, total joiner. Brownies, drama club, summer camp. I was raised by fantastic hippie parents who taught me the importance of making the world better. Also bring snacks, be ready for sing-alongs. I'm incredibly organized, I'm a big connector. I've been told I have big cruise director energy. <laughs> no clipboard today. I was also in a cult for 12 years. And I'm here today to protect you all from the same shit show that I went through. <laughs> yeah, you want this. <laughs> My talk is rooted in awareness. I want to help you to navigate all the culty groups out there so that you can seek safely. So, in 2005, I was an aspiring actress slash waitress when I was invited to Nexium, a personal and professional development program with a seemingly altruistic mission to change the world one person at a time. Big red flag. And I truly found an incredible community of like-minded humanitarians and a place where I could help people set and achieve goals and bust through their limiting beliefs. It was wonderful but it was also a facade for something sinister, something that would take over my life slowly over a decade with a slow build of coercion, obligation, gaslighting, and control. It wasn't just a highly toxic workplace, this was a high-control group, a.k.a. a cult. But I couldn't see it. There were so many great things about the community clouding my judgment. I rose up the ranks, became one of the company's star recruiters. It was incredible. I thought that I had found the best club ever. My people, the, the chosen family, but more importantly, a place where I had community and belonging. Those were things I was looking for ever since I was a little girl. I had actually wandered onto the path of self-reflection and transformation without any tools for navigating or protecting myself. But I was in deep. <laughs> My actual friends and family saw less and less of me. My, as I'd spent more money on time and trainings, and my worldview got more narrow. My language became coded. I sounded like a Nexium robot. I was on the top of this grifty iceberg, a Nexium pyramid, and it truly haunts me to this day. How many people I brought in, my friends and family, who in turn brought in their friends and family through leveraged trust, till I had grown an organization so big, I could open the first center in Canada, which was something I used to be incredibly proud of. Some of those people are still loyal to the cult to this day. It all came to a head when I was invited to a secret Nexium offshoot, a badass boot camp for women only, sold to me as empowerment when it was actually enslavement, just a way for Keith Raniere, the company's founder, to brand women as if he owned them. Yeah. He also blackmailed many of them into sex. I managed to dodge that bullet, but literally dozens of women were not that lucky. Thankfully, it was the branding that woke me up. I mean, one minute you're selling a goals program, and the next minute you're sweaty and naked on a table being branded in a secret sorority. And it wasn't the moment of the branding itself. No, nope, not when I was sliced open without anesthetic. But later, when I found out that the symbol on my body was not that of the four elements, as I'd been told, but actually Keith Raniere's initials in a cryptic monogram. Yeah, I had his initials on my body. He literally thought he could own me. He was wrong, and I was out. But, yes, thank you. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> what happened to me was just the beginning. And when we found out what else was going on behind closed doors, I'm talking crimes ranging from blackmail, forced labor, child pornography, sex trafficking. I was mortified. So I went to the authorities with a 
band of fellow shocked ex-members and we blew the proverbial whistle, but they didn't do anything. Fell on deaf ears because they didn't know what they were looking at. So we went to the press. Look, mom and dad, <laughs> I'm on the front page of the New York Times. It's not exactly what I was imagining my life would be when I started out as an actress, but here we are. After that, the rest is cult history. An investigation by the Southern District of New York, a dramatic arrest in Mexico, a six-week trial, a four-hour deliberation, and ultimately, a 120-year prison sentence for Nexium's founder. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Big win. And just for the record, by all cult expert assessments, Keith Raniere is now known as one of the most dangerous cult leaders of all time. On par with Jim Jones, whose rise to power culminated in the death of 900 people, 300 of which were children, for drinking poisoned flavor aid, which is where the term drink the Kool-Aid comes from, by the way. And FYI, if they hadn't have drunk it, they would have been shot. It wasn't a choice. We don't use that phrase properly. It's called a bounded choice, coercive control. Needless to say, Keith Raniere was not the noble, humanitarian, ethical genius I thought I was vouching for all those years. Quite the opposite, actually. Nobody signs up for trauma and tragedy on purpose. In fact, a wise man once said, nobody joins a cult on purpose. They join something good. I was on my path, I was a seeker, and I got burned, literally. I was blackmailed, branded, humiliated, and I got out. But I couldn't just leave. I had to be as loud about why I was leaving as when I was recruiting. And I've been out for six years, almost to the day, actually. Happy uncultiversary to me. Thank you. <laughs> and you could say my story's out there <laughs> in raw, gritty, personal detail. Thank you, HBO. I have been to hell and back in high definition. And I could definitely glean some nuggets for you about resiliency and trauma, turning lemons into lemonade. But today I'm here for a different reason. I want to share with you cult li literacy. Cult literacy. New thing for all of us. I want to share some lessons learned so that you can seek safely. I want to show you how cults prey on your humanity and leave no one immune. Good plan? Okay. So first, you have to know that these things are everywhere. Cults are everywhere, and they don't look like what you think anymore. We're not talking about shaved heads and drinking goat's blood and some Stanley Kubrick horror movie, eyes wide shut, masks and robes, no. Cults thrive by disguising themselves as something wonderful that appeals to your total normal humanity, your desire for connection, meaning, and purpose. All of those things are really beautiful. It might look like a a hot yoga class, where everyone's so friendly afterwards. Thank you so much for coming. Can I get you a kombucha? <laughs> a course on leadership and communication. A retreat on wellness and spirituality. An incredible business opportunity to sell a life-changing product from the comfort of your own home. Hashtag financial freedom, hashtag boss babe. You know who I'm talking about or a Sunday coffee hour where the congregation or the sorority sisters or Montessori moms are all so quick to welcome you and shower you with praise. Oh, well, bless your heart. Oh my God, I love your hair. Welcome to the family. I'm not condemning any one of these things, trust me. I just want you to see the precursors. I want you to be able to tell the difference between a healthy human thing and something with a malignant endgame. Which brings me to the second thing I want you to know. Cults prey on your humanity in a way that is predictable in textbook. Do people keep telling you how special you are? Yeah, well, the special part is probably true. <laughs> But if that's combined with a lot of direct eye-gazing and effusive smiles, <laughs> that might not be love, but love-bombing. 
a manipulation strategy that's designed to reel you in, something that's been used by so many people, from sex traffickers to David Koresh the infamous and ultimately doomed leader of the Branch Davidians that led to the Waco tragedy, to Keith Raniere, to your next-door neighbor selling essential oils out of the back of her trunk. All that love is designed to make you feel like you're part of something. The best yoga, the best fraternity, the best TEDx. Am I right? Best TEDx? <laughs> This is the best TEDx, just to be honest. <laughs> Thank you, yes, Dave. All of that love is designed to make you feel like you are part of something. That's it. Are you part of a course or a group that's telling you that they've got the answers to life's questions? Or even better yet, the answers and the solutions to the world's problems. Careful, that's dogma or doctrine. And those courses you're buying could just be classic indoctrination. You feel righteous about a group being the right way or the only way? That's basic us versus them mentality that's baked right in, that's a very convenient way for culty bad guys to isolate you from other people and the outside world. All of these tactics, offering answers and solutions and community and love and all these good things, it's just what binds you to the group slowly over time, just like the frog in the pot of water. You know this cliche, right? You throw the frog in a pot of hot boiling water, it jumps out. Who knows what's going on? But if you put it in cold water and you turn the heat up slowly, it stays in. It doesn't notice. Just like you don't notice because it feels so good to be loved and be part of something. Or maybe you're just trying to get your money's, your money's worth or, like me, prove your friends and family wrong. I'm not in a cult. And if and when that you notice that it's not what you signed up for, in the beginning, it's too late. You're just a frog. You're bought in and you've been boiled. Okay, so how do you know the difference between love versus love bombing? The tools, helpful tools, versus the tools of coercive control? And something altruistic versus smoke and mirrors to hide something shady. How do you do that human thing called seeking when cults are insidious and any group can become culty? That's right, any group. Okay, first, you can write this down. You seek the key. But you must first learn the discipline. Unlock the energy within. You're not immune to cultic influence. Nobody is. And I know some of you are thinking that. That'll never happen to me. If you think you're not susceptible, you're more susceptible than you know. You might see some red flags and think you're just going to a carnival. Nexium fooled some really brilliant people. Heads of state, captains of industry, business leaders. It's because this stuff isn't so obvious. It's just dynamics. It's called an abuse of power. Like, you ever had a boss ask you to work late and weekends, asking you to prove your commitment to the company and you kind of felt like you couldn't say no? Or had a significant other text you constantly and love bomb you, make you feel special, only, there for, only for them to ghost you and have you question your own worth? or been a part of a demanding social group. And you knew that if you missed even one night, you might be on the outs for a while. It could be anything from a group of college friends to a book club. And remember, it doesn't matter how rational and skeptical you are, you're all susceptible. And look, hey, fair enough, you might not have been interested in Nexium in my cult, I get it. But with the right place at the right time and the right trusted person inviting you, you may say yes to something else. Everybody's got their something, their hook. Remember, it doesn't look like what you see on your streaming platforms. It could be as fun and friendly as, you want to check out a spin class? A makeup party with wine and cheese. Hey, let's go phone bank for our favorite candidate. Have you ever tried cold plunging? I see you, Portland. <laughs> That's why it's so important to know the signs and red flags of cultic abuse, especially in this day and age. We've all had to become hip in regards to internet safety, catfishing ha and hacking. How about we learn some cult literacy? So I'm going to teach you a couple red flags, not all of them, but a couple red flags so you can spot the signs. And remember, not any one of these things in and of itself is the problem, it's the whole package. So please know, the first thing is there's an assumption of your neediness. 
You're a broken bird, you're unwhole, and they have all the tools to make you whole again. That's very convenient. Secondly, it's expensive. And please know that it might cost you more than money. It could cost you in time and relationships. Also, loaded language. If they're using pretentious terms to sound holier and smarter, run. <laughs> Be aware if there's rumors that they're a cult already or if there's lawsuits or bad press. Where there's smoke, there is usually fire. And finally, if they're claiming to have the definitive answers to life's mysteries, big red flag. Oh, my green flags are up already. It's important to also see green flags that can signal this is a safe group. Like, questions are welcomed. You can ask things without being gaslit. Also, you can leave without being excommunicated, shunned, or trash-talked. Finally, there's a healthy amount of commitment. Not an all-consuming change of your entire lifestyle. Hello, CrossFit. <laughs> One more thing. It doesn't pop up in Google with articles from legit publications if you type in, is blank a cult? <laughs> You'd be surprised how many people miss that one. I personally never Googled, next day, I mean, it was 2005, but I never did. And look where that got me. So do your research, people. But here I am now. I had it removed. <laughs> Yes, free of all that. Yay, plastic surgery. I'm healing, and part of that healing is I'm just trying to clean up the mess that I helped make as the golden goose for Nexium. And I'm also trying to, just as loudly as I vouched for Keith years before, I'm loudly trying to educate my fellow joiners out there about seeking safely. So, ultimately, the best advice I have for you to avoid a culty nightmare is just remember that all of these programs and communities and tools and answers and all this stuff is just a tool, not an answer. Nobody has all the answers. And I'm not here to point fingers and say, you're in a cult and that's a cult, or throw that word around loosely. Hey, you don't even have to use the word cult. I just want you all to be able to determine if whatever you're part of or thinking about joining is healthy for you. That's it. Because, of course, it's great to have new ideas to put into your tool belt of life. That's likely why you're here today. Just don't make the tools your life. Maybe you don't need a guru. Maybe you don't need a fancy retreat or an essential oil starter kit to be a better you. You're on a path of self-discovery and knowledge but you're already whole right now. So this is my idea for you. And I hope you remember it on your journey. Because to seek is so human. And to seek wisely is a very smart idea. I want only the best for all of you, so safe travels. Thank you.